Welcome to the Shire Fit Podcast. We created this podcast to help you achieve your goals. I'm Jack Fletney, the founder of Shire Fit, and my aim is to give you the best fitness, business, and mindset advice so you can go and smash your goals. This week, we had the opportunity of sitting down with Maria Costello, MBE, and talking all about motorcycle racing, and specifically racing professionally at the highest level there is. I think the big takeaway from this podcast is that everyone behind the layers of what we put out is the same. We all have the same issues, we all have the highs and lows. And you can hear all about the dedication it takes to get to the highest level of the sport. And even when you're there, there's still so much more work to do to try and achieve your goals. Hang on. No, seriously, yeah, you're in. I'm not joking. <laughs> awesome, Maria. Uh, thanks for so much for jumping on the podcast. Um, we are very, very honoured to have Maria Costello, MBE as well on the podcast how are you doing you're right it's great to be in here it's great to be invited to be on your podcast thank you very much that's all right well obviously we've known each other how long now god well it's before this opened it's just before wellingborough opened yeah it feels like an absolute no i'm joking (laughs) (laughs) yeah well we we met i think it was it must i think we met in the summer before we opened the gym so it must have been around six to nine months before yeah we opened up because you saw and i think what year was that that was 2014. Gosh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. it was, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm just sat here looking through all the different things you've done as well. Manx Grand Prix from 2002 <laughs> to 2004, Classic TT. Yeah, but it started way before Isle of Man. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about that. And obviously, uh, for any of you that don't know, Maria Costello is obviously famous for, uh, well, you're famous for your motorbike racing. And, yeah. um And also, you are like a proper Shire girl. You're from Northamptonshire, aren't you? Like Proper, yeah, Northamptonshire person yeah born and bred your surname where's your what's your where's your surname from costello but that's um irish that's um okay. yeah my grandparents were irish and that which makes me think gosh you know maybe there was something in the blood to do with the uh, road racing because it's yeah, a it's massive huge over there isn't thing it over there yeah yeah and that's one of the things i was looking at northwest a minute ago and obviously that's over an island isn't yeah. it so if we rewind back we'll go from the right from the start and we'll work through slowly because obviously there's so many different things you've done over the last 20 30 years and obviously being from Northampton what what pushed you in the direction of getting into motorbikes and how did it even start like your interest in it at all yeah so it does start way back um the first mode of transport I had was a very uncool Honda Melody scooter which I bought from raising money (laughs) by looking after people's pets animals were my first love then yeah that was super dangerous because you spent your time riding in the gutter So that was that was just after school. I left okay. um, school to, um, to train as a veterinary nurse. So yeah, oh, so uncool. I was showing some kids some pictures of me on my scooter yesterday. Not cool. Anyway, then <laughs> started having car lessons. Everybody wanted me to get a car. Failed my car test twice. Not good. Um, friends of the family, their son had a motorbike. Um, and his family suggested that I get one. And I thought this was great, especially as I fancied their son. And my mum was horrified. She was just horrified. And um, she, but she had to. So I picked out the bike, TZR 125. Um, Didn't even go with a 50. Went went straight to 125. Yeah. Well, this is it. So my mum had to come and find this, uh, sign the finance in the bike shop, and she walked out. Had to drag her back in. <laughs> promised that I'd take all extra lessons and do all extra training to be super safe. And because yeah, she was looking at all the scooters, and then I point at this big red <laughs> and white motorbike and. Yeah, but that was, um, yeah, that was massive and I loved it and loved going fast. Obviously, I qualified as a veterinary nurse, but this motorbike just changed everything. I started hanging out at the local bike bike shop all the time, made more friends that had motorbikes and and actually hanging out in that bike shop, I went from working as a veterinary nurse to getting a job in that bike shop. Uh, It doesn't actually exist anymore. It was that long ago. Okay. Um, But yeah, so everything just became about motorbikes. And then um, a couple of my mates and I were going to share a race bike. But what I haven't told you is how I got the money to buy the race bike, which is I got knocked off on my way to work one morning actually see that. by a car driver with dodgy eyesight and I got compensation money. Uh, okay, so that's that's pretty much what started the journey off. Absolutely. You have to thank, thank that person for it in the first big place. Big time. It was like a lottery win, really. It was a big chunk of money okay. for me. And um, yeah, so then we were going to share a race bike, but they got girlfriends and I went racing. 
Yeah. That's amazing. And sorry, were you, how old were you then when you actually, so you qualified as, an, as a veterinary nurse, didn't you? How old were yeah. you after that? Um, I, would, I didn't start racing until I was 20. Okay. Nearly 21. And when, and you, and I've heard rumours that you're famous at your school for like sort of turning up on your motorbike <laughs> and being really cool, even though you just said you weren't cool. Well, when I got that motorbike, obviously the, the motorbike was much cooler than the scooter. And I, di- I do, I did go back there to kind of show it off. Um, and um yeah but we i used to hang out with with that lad the family you know i mentioned yeah. suggested getting a, motor, a motorbike and we all used to hang out in the village in in spratton and then we'd go for like right my parents just never saw me because i'd be out on my motorbike all night yeah and um yeah loved it loved it and i i think i'm the only one out of that whole group though that's still got a motorbike really i think <laughs> and lisa that's really interesting as well because i think often like people might hear about your story and i definitely had it from other like professional sports people that they, people can't appreciate like the time and the effort the hardships you go along the journey and towards where wherever you're trying to get on it and um and probably i'm sure people think oh maria jumped on a bike and raced literally raced immediately and was really good at it but yes. you, you forget you know all those times of for you you probably race around <laughs> the villages i'm guessing yeah and, i think that's and, where and, i learned my yeah especially for road racing but that was where the sort of that's where it began where the racing began um but um yeah i came I came from a small family we lived in a council house there's no way it was going to come from anywhere else i didn't have that money to put into the racing mm. so that really was a silver lining to that black cloud you know getting knocked off and um yeah um how yeah. did you then get into racing so how so that was really like helped by working in that bike shop um f- some mates introduced me to a guy who actually lives in wellingborough um, and he was a racer and he took me along to watch some races and I remember seeing Sandra Barnett she was the only woman at this race meeting competing and I think that really did flick that switch and go look if she can do it maybe I can do it and um, had the money that compensation money and uh, Dave Weston then s- sort of became my mentor we went around looking for some motorbikes and eventually found an RGV 250 that I started racing yeah and, and then crashing you li- a lot <laughs> did you literally just turn up then and sign up and compete in a race Did you so, lo- was it like a local race was it or yeah it's much easier uh, you don't have to go through as much training and um, newcomer stuff um then now mm. now there's a lot more to it which is great because you you learn a lot more before you start but yeah it was in at the deep end got my race bike went and, and went racing yeah dave weston was racing his bike and i'd park my van up next to his and um yeah my first race was absolutely a baptism of fire because i remember suddenly thinking oh my gosh i've never done a race start and turned around to my mate Neil and went how do I do this and he just went rev it to 12 grand and dump the clutch and I just <laughs> everyone else is in turn one I'm doing this massive wheelie and I can't wheelie oh and God. and oh yeah anyway I finished the race but that was the worst start of and that was how I started racing that's amazing somebody that's... had a video of that as well I wish I still had oh, that let's see if we can try and find it maybe oh. it's on YouTube somewhere <laughs> yeah that's amazing. And <laughs> sometimes being jumped in like or being thrown into the deep end though is often the best way, isn't it? If you're that totally. way inclined as well, just to yes, because so, I am a bit of an overthinker, and yeah, we're just in there doing it. But I loved it. I I never really was competitive at school. I remember I was quite good at cross country running, and they put me in to run for the county, and I hated it. I yeah, hated I'm, it. I'm, I'm yet to find many people that enjoy cross country running. To be fair, <laughs> like but I loved was. it until it came to competitions. But suddenly I'm racing motorbikes and loving yeah being competitive and wanting to be good at it. Yeah. And having that sort of passion and hunger. So where yeah. where where does it go from here? So you you obviously did your first race, and then how do you train? How do you obviously get time on the bike? Is it literally <laughs> just turn up to different race meets? Yeah, and... yeah. And I was doing a lot of racing at the start. There was a lot of it was all club meetings. Yeah, yeah, local stuff. A lot of stuff at Mallory Park, which is only down the road. And really, whatever Dave Weston would be doing, I'd be there. Okay, mimicking that. And um, yeah, had a lot of races, but had a lot of crashes. You know, it's a good job that bike came with a big spares package because we were we were getting through it and and that was kind of how I was learning my craft maybe not the best way but yeah patches all over my leathers and a few scars here and there but was was mainly getting up you know and and getting back on it and just so driven by it I remember them putting stitches in my chin once and I was, I was back out that afternoon I'm not sure like I'd do player, that yeah. now <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's fantastic um 
And where did your progression start? Because you you started raw first race, and obviously now we think about you know. And I, I, genuinely, I didn't actually appreciate all the things you, do, you you've done in the past until I actually properly got to know you. And then I looked through and saw all the There's things. There's a big history. You know, there is. Because how, how long have you been racing it's for? It's 24 years this year. 24 that's years. It's a long yeah. time. How old are you, Jack? Um, I am 27. <laughs> okay, so that's you know, it's not a lot yeah, more yeah. than you've been on this planet. Yeah, so. which is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? So um, yeah, so where, where how sort how do you start to grow? How did you make it into sort of like your your sort of central thing that you concentrate on and progress then? Yeah. So um, I think. The key thing that happened at the start was I got picked by Sandra Barnett and her husband who wanted to run an all-female team. So she's the current fastest woman at the TT course at that time. And this was like getting a Grand Prix ride for me. Like, can you imagine in your first year of racing and they pick you out to be in a team? So I went from racing my own bike the first year to then being in a team um, with two other women, including the fastest woman at the TT on four stroke um, 600 so I went from riding racing a 250 to a 600 and the plan was that we would go to the Isle of Man the Manx Grand Prix Sandra would do the TT and we'd do the amateur version and <laughs> this so uh, they had a big launch party again my mum and dad are there and this is when the team principal stands up and says oh yes and Maria and Bridget are going to do the Manx Grand Prix at the Isle of Man and my mum walks out again because she oh god the yeah. one thing I'd promised my mum was that I wouldn't race at the Isle of Man oh uh, okay yeah yeah <laughs> but suddenly in my second year of racing I'm there that's um, that's that's so quick isn't yes, it? It's amazing, yes yeah. and I wouldn't advise anyone to do it that way really if I look you know if I think about it now like going to do like the hardest road race course in your second year of racing it's mental but I did um actually my boyfriend that year had been racing at the TT and he'd really badly hurt himself and I turned around to the team because obviously Sandra was there and said I'm never coming back here I'm I'm not stepping foot on this island. This I mean, is how horrendous. Many, how many have you done now, Maria? <laughs> how many is it now? You've yeah, done? I've done twenty TTs. Twenty TTs. Yeah. Do, do you or still, do twenty you... Isle of Man? You know, including Max Grand Prix. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember your first one, or is it quite? Is it sort of? No, I can remember bits of it, but uh, because there was obviously that massive switch in, I'm never going back to. Oh no, actually, I am going to do this because I'm not going to let what he did stop me from yeah. going there and I said to the team can I come and do some laps and if I don't like it you know and they were like yeah that's oh well, that's absolutely fine so that's I went there did three laps fell in love with it then had difficulties within the team because no that's how Sandra rides the bike so that's how you will have to ride it oh, okay, and, yeah. and I was having lots of problems and I said no I can't race it like that and eventually they said oh okay no um, don't leave the team you can do what you want to change was that, it. Is that like a style of race? Or was it kind it of was bike actually, or? I needed to change my tyres, change my suspension because the bike was all over the place for me. Sandra was obviously, you know, much more used to riding these 600s, but um, on, on Dunlop tyres, which were much more pointed tyres. So it'd mean the bike would, would basically sort of tank slap. So move from so the handlebars would try and pull out oh, your okay. hands. Yeah. So I was having lots of that going on, which was really scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, because I think I was, just as a bit of background for the TT, so the TT course, how how yeah. how far is it? So it's nearly 40 miles per lap. 40 miles with per lap. over 200 corners 200 per corners. lap and each race is at least four laps long okay. with a pit stop because um a bike will only do two laps okay per full tank of fuel oh of course yeah and um what's what's like what you what's your top average speed around the course mine's actually 116 mile an hour average 116. Which, so that's average as well and then what's your top speed you know top, top speed, speed it's 180 something like that we don't have um that is that is that is crazy to even appreciate but i need to actually say that things have massively moved on so for the for the top boys now they're doing 134 mile an hour average which is another that's another level yeah i I recommend actually jumping onto youtube and watching like yeah go watch them on boards watch them yeah just see it because you you, like until i've actually watched one them before and i was like wow like you don't any appreciation obviously then the top thing on top of all that is this is not on an actual track is it you've got no. houses to your left right fields yep. cliffs as that's you exactly go the it it's a real road um that runs through villages up and down a mountain yeah. back through another town and and we deal with all that normal road furniture because it gets closed off to the public and we get to race on it 
That's awesome. I remember um, I remember when I went to Isle of Man and sort of seeing some of the roads. I forgot that you'd then, been there. Yeah, I've been there a few times. And then obviously, and then going up the um, going up the mountain as well, because you've got that mountain right up you, because um, I remember like the stand that goes over the top of the road that stays there permanently yeah. that you can see as you people come <coughs> over. And then that's a bit real, and then you realise that. And I remember it was all foggy, <laughs> and I was thinking, Jesus, Which, can yeah. imagine flying around here and, and going. But So you, you uh, now how long does a lap take you? So for me, it's about what 19 minutes something 19 like that the, bo- the top boys are doing mile. it in 17 now yeah yeah it's bonkers that that's absolutely amazing isn't it and then um so you did you, so you did your sort of first tt got got hungry for well it, it was the manx grand Sorry, prix manx, that i started yeah. at so the yeah. amateur version so you can't earn money there and it's yeah. uh, smaller cc bikes um but yeah then and then what you could do was actually do the Manx Grand Prix but also do the TT as well in the production classes um, that isn't possible anymore but that's what I did so I would do both events um, and that was that was fantastic for me and that's when I started going after that female lap record that I wanted I wanted I wanted to take it off Sandra Barnett <laughs> and how long did it take do you know I'd have to have a look in my oh um, I've got a list it here. might not even be on when did I do that um, 2000 and T- fast, fastest on the Manx, 2002. Fastest, fastest ever on the TT, 2004. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I actually did it with a broken collarbone because I'd crashed a couple of weeks before testing. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, went to see one of those weird doctors that did like I don't know laser therapy, okay. which doesn't work. And um, yeah, but went there with a broken collarbone, raced round, then came home, and I couldn't push open a door so it's amazing how Adrenaline mind over matter through. and all yeah. that yeah 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 that's and so that's so when did you when did you what year was it you started racing i ra- started racing in 1993 or eight. oh 98 oh yeah of course 96 96 yeah. yeah so yeah so it took you pretty much six six years to get the manx and then yeah. eight to get the fastest ever on the tt as well yeah. because it's not just about you either it's about what machinery you've got the team you've got around you there's a lot of variables yeah it is a big team sport isn't it there's a lot of like you said there's a lot of things to rely on in terms of equipment and yes. team backup and then all the things that happen before and after the race that sort of prepare <laughs> yes. you for that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, broken bones. Did you did you ever use sort of fitness as a sort of preparation for you in racing, or was it very much like you would just concentrate on that sport and that was it, or did you use anything else to help you? Yeah, no, I always, I think from the very beginning, realised that I could never afford to get enough time on the track or practising, so I needed to work on my physical fitness away from the track, which was at the gym, and um, I have worked with a lot of people over the years um, who have sort of come on board as my personal trainers and yeah so there's always been that that those people in the background physiotherapists sports therapists all sorts hypnotherapists um, yeah all sorts sports psychologists I've tried them all yeah well I think you have to though when you're at that level of sport you've got to try and find the perfect thing for you to get to that yeah. next level isn't there and totally. like you said you think there's there's an average of 10 miles per hour in the difference of what there is as the highest ever and where you want to try and get to which is, if you look at it is actually so small and so fine changes and things you have to do and um so obviously you started doing this was there a point where you made it pretty much your career as in it you became what you say as a professional and uh, and started gaining things like sponsorship and racing and so sponsorship was always had to play a part yeah. right from the very beginning from word dot i had like budget rent a car loaning me vans i had and i was and that was definitely helped by the fact that i was female and i learned to write my own press releases and build up my own sort of media connection so the local newspapers followed me from word dot as well that helped me get local companies on board then i could go racing because i didn't have a van i didn't have lots of things that i needed yeah. and um, that that was a massive part of it and i that's definitely been a help with continuing my career and maintaining it and learning all those those skills other than riding the bike so um but uh, when it when it became professional that isn't until recently that's probably the past since i've known you yeah. probably yeah and how and what were you doing beforehand to sort of get yourself through the race all season? sorts and everything yeah i had i used to have like three jobs um I had some 
good jobs that were really flexible. So being like a PR agent for a motorcycle clothing company. But I also worked in call centres. Um, gosh, I, all sorts. Yeah. Just to get by so you could get on that bike and Absolutely. go and race. Um, and obviously then we've got all these different lists. Did you find yourself as you went as you went through your racing through years, if we say like from like 2002 onwards, was there like a continuation of improvement, like nice linear progression or was it ups, downs, all over the place? Where did you, how did you find it sort of? I think, I think being introduced to the Isle of Man was really massive because that's where I, I carried on on short circuits as well as doing the roads or, or mainly the Isle of Man. Um, from the very beginning but then t later on I found that road racing was really where my heart was and where my I could make you know more successes and achieve more um, because short circuit racing is that much more expensive whereas it was more manageable on the roads you don't actually get through as many tires and, and I, I could have a better profile there and get better sponsorship um, and that's probably what changed as well when I became more professional is that I concentrated more on the road racing but mainly yeah it was it was a sort of steady progression and I could see that and it was only then when I had massive crashes that that would interrupt that kind of process and it was when I had a big crash in 2005 at the Isle of Man and um, I'd gone from no, was it 2006? 2005, I think, is when I got the female podium. So the first woman to stand on the podium in a race around the TT course at the Manx Grand Prix. Then the next year, we went back to try and win it. I'd finished third. We went back to try and win it. Um, this guy developed a new bike, but it really wasn't developed enough. We blew up about three engines. I was running out of options. It was the end of practice week. We brought back the guy who owned the bike that I'd finished on the podium he sent it over to me um, so we had the l last practice session um, to qualify for that race and um, I actually crashed on somebody else's oil they'd just crashed on the same corner not long before me everything was cleared away but they didn't have yellow flags out and I crashed on the I don't think they realized there was oil down but yes and I hit this bank ended up in all this heather um, broken femur broken shoulder blade um, yeah absolutely in bits and uh, the bike was too and it wasn't my bike and oh that God, this that's this, that's this actually had a massive effect on me not just psycholo uh, physically but psychologically yeah it took me a long time to get back to loving my racing again somehow I carried on racing I look back and I'm like why because I would literally be sat in my van crying before the race sat in the van crying after the race because I was not getting the results I wanted because I just wasn't in this good place yeah but somehow I carried on and then I a, a person who I kind of put in the sort of place of helping me was a hypnotherapist who I still use Christian Baker and then I went to the Manx Grand Prix just after we'd started working together and I got my mojo back and that and then from there on to this day I've I've sort of had another career it feels like mm. with lots of good um, achievements yeah. was there was there something that sort of changed immediately was it something that ticked your mindset and made you think right and bring it bring back that, that <clears throat> hunger or he helped me to understand to deal with um, with what I was dealing with which was feeling unsuccessful and you know not being able to achieve not being able to do what I loved and achieve what I wanted to be moving forward and it kind of he calmed it all down and got me back to the basics of enjoying it yeah which we were just talking about earlier it's got to be the key it's, it's the key to everything yeah that's amazing and uh injury list then <laughs> we'll sit here for a while now but yeah <sighs> I, obviously I don't have a first I'm not gonna you. bore you with it but, <laughs> but yeah, yes yeah you, how, so, do you know how many bones you've broken at least 24 yeah yeah and and yeah some of those little ones so lots in my wrist that was a, that was a a sort of almost career changing injury breaking that but yeah I've broken my femur twice I've broken my scapula twice I've broken both collarbones twice yeah yeah and I, I met you at a time when I was I was failing as a racer because my body seemed to be giving up on me a bit and I had people around me sports um, uh, physiotherapists telling me no maybe you can't 
be successful at this maybe you can't carry on your body is restricting you now you can't do this you can't do that you can't run you can't squat you can't do overhead and I was kind of trapped in this position with these people trying to carry on with my sport but mentally I was being squashed down mm. Yeah, I, I remember that we were just talking earlier with me about the first time we met, which is just coincidence, really. By no, it's, you know, someone well known, Donna from yes. um, from the Wollaston Centre, and then uh, yeah, and obviously yeah, and then we sort of just randomly met up, and I think we did our first session, didn't we? And then we just sort of <laughs> yeah. went from there. Donna actually said to me, she said, "You, I know you're going to really enjoy working with Jack initially, but there's going to become a point where you're going to hate me for introducing." <laughs> <laughs> you too, <laughs> because yeah. I think that was the first session. To be fair, <laughs> yes. wasn't it? Yeah, the first session. I think I had to go and have a sleep after that. I I was, but I was training in such a different place, wasn't I? Yeah. It was. It was all small movements and and, and it was it was good stuff, mm. but it wasn't getting me stronger. It wasn't helping me psychologically. Yeah, well, I remember. I remember initially when we first spoke. I think you've been following the program for quite some time, hadn't you? It was relatively repetitive, and you felt really repetitive. Like you, like you hadn't, you weren't sort of getting to that point you wanted to get to. And as you said earlier, my big thing was actually, can we get your mindset in the right place where you feel like you're progressing, you feel positive, and you feel like you know. And sometimes that is through hard work. Yeah. But we knew the limitation was some of your injuries and also your perceptions of what those injuries were creating. So I remember was like squatting was a no running was yeah. a definite no wasn't it yeah and then things I, and, I couldn't run um but yeah then obviously looking through your injury list we had I was in a lot of pain actually yeah. which and, and it's quite good to look back you know they say look back to see how far you've come yeah having this conversation with you today has made me do that and yeah I was in a lot of pain then I mean I have had operations to reduce that pain as well since yeah. but um yeah that was uh, yeah restrict people were restricting me with uh perceptions like you say and I believed them I think at the time I was like no Jack we can't do running and no we can't squat because I, c I can't move into yeah. those positions and yeah it was uh, it was massive well I, all I remember was um number one was obviously just te like teaching you can still work really hard as in like because because what you've been doing in the past now was all controlled and trying yes. not to hurt yourself you can still work hard and we could sort of in, in essence scale things for you to do that couldn't you and we build up towards you getting to the point you wanted to get to and then the second thing was just developing strength yeah. because you've been doing lots of things to control it you you'd lost your raw strength which meant those injuries were taking a big hit um, but I remember like you know you worked really really hard on it and you're really dedicated towards it and I think one of my the sort of the moment I was like, yes, the, here we go. It was when you first had the confidence to uh, have a go at jogging on a treadmill. And I remember when you I were remember there. that yeah. so clearly. Yeah. Walking into the gym and you saying, get on the treadmill. I was thinking, well, we can't run. We won't be running. And you were in control of the speed. Yeah. And you, I was running. Yeah. And it didn't hurt. Yeah. And it was a massive light bulb moment for me. Just... And, and building up the strength in my body was building up the strength in my mind. And I'm not saying I'm the strongest person mentally by any means, but it, God, it was a massive turning point. I can't thank you enough for that. Well, you did the work, if I'm honest. We sort of gave you quite a general sort of thing to develop on. You had to put the work. I said to everyone that says, oh, it's because of this and this, but at the end of the day, it's just you going in there and doing the basics and working hard at them and getting to where you want to get to. But what for you, mindset-wise... Obviously, we've spent a lot of time talking about this, but for you in your race, when it comes to racing and things, how, what makes you get on that bike and be able to go 140 miles an hour on average <laughs> around a course where you know the dangers are there and things? What What do you do before that race and sort of preparation? Well, I have a, I have a little routine, but it's it's really quite basic, which includes the warm up that you've given me, um, but. Actually, I have to work on my own self-belief quite a lot. And even before every race, I have to put myself in this position where I feel comfortable to do what I'm able to do. And it's the simplest thing. It's saying, I can do this. Mm. And uh, and I used to have a, a young Irish mechanic. He was a great kid, great lad. And he was really good at saying the things I needed to hear. And he's and he would always say, "You can do this, Maria. This is what you do. Um, just go and do what you do." And just those simple things would, because I love I love racing motorbikes. I love going fast. And then, obviously, I've I 
the, I think the thing that gives me the most nerves, because people say, oh, do you get nervous, is the expectation. And that expectation is just me wanting to achieve a certain result in that race or, or whatever. So, yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, I think sure? it did. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, being out, I think that positive reinforcement. But it's, I think it's really important to know that someone that's been so successful can still have those thoughts and it's it's important to understand that because everyone does sometimes people hide it really really well and sometimes you know that comparison someone looking at you and going oh Maria has no issues at all or doesn't think she she knows she can do something but actually there is that there is still those self-doubts and there is still those thoughts isn't there massively I I think we hide it for a reason because we want to come across strong people people are much more open about talking about those things in general now anyway aren't they I think particularly sports people because for me I'll I'll learn from other sports people and learning that they have vulnerability as well and learning that they have to work it it actually adds strength to yourself as well going oh no it's all right to be vulnerable but then when I'm the racer I have to become that the strong Maria the bike racer Maria and it does feel like I have two personas for sure oh no that makes complete sense I think uh (coughs) so recently or what we've got coming up in the future for you now have you well I think actually probably before we even get to that point MBE because you got to meet the Queen <laughs> I didn't meet the Queen did you not I no, wonder you got to meet the Prince Queen Charles. who was it oh Prince Charles, it was Prince Charles. even better no, <laughs> <laughs> no but so, every, like, so how did that come about and what happened okay so you get a letter through the post and to this day I do not know who put me forward but I would guess it was Sport England because um, I was doing a lot of work with them at the time and obviously they're used to putting all their Olympic athletes through that process and I was I was achieving a lot at that time and um, yeah I think they must have they must have done that but I still don't know anyway you get a letter and it just happened that I was picking up my mail from my parents and my dad was my mum was out my dad was there and I sat there and I went is this a joke dad have you done this because it was like a letter with the Buckingham Palace emblem and, and I was like what on it and I sat there reading it. I was like this is a joke right and I gave, I said dad read that and he kind of went well I don't know <laughs> I don't even. know he said but you've got to tick a box and send this back to accept it he said you better do that and I literally did it there and then I put it in the envelope and walked to the post box and um, it also said in the letter make sure you keep this a secret because it doesn't get announced um, for a while a few months and I said, Dad, we better not tell Mum because she'll just tell everyone. So we kept it a secret from my mum. And then it was like months later. I was at the TT. I don't think I was riding. I was working. Um, and um, I was working doing press work. And so this journalist from The Sun emailed me saying, congratulations. And I was like, what for? I'm not I'm not racing here. He went, no, for your MB. And I was like, oh, my God, it's real. <laughs> and that's when it really, you know, uh, and I was like, wow. And then and then you got all the official stuff through and, and um, yeah, got to go to Buckingham Palace. And that was a massive day. But because I'm such a tight ass, I wouldn't book a hotel. We drove down early in the morning and got stuck in traffic. Oh, no. It, yeah. And I'm sat. I'm sat in the car, I'm driving. My sister sat in the front of me. She's going, you're going to miss this. This is the biggest day ever and you're going to miss it. And I was like, shh, mum's going to kill us. <laughs> anyway, I got my mate who worked for Virgin Limo Bikes at the time. I rang him. I was like, Damien, I'm stuck in traffic. He went, you're supposed to be at the palace. I went, yep. He went, right, I'm on my way. Picked me up, but left. obviously left all my family in the car on the oh, side of the road. Okay. My mum's bawling her eyes out because she's not going to get to Buckingham Palace. Anyway... I'm on the. F- I get there, um, and I'm walking through the gates, try- speaking to my sister, who's trying to direct my dad. And the police uh, policeman's like, "Sorry, you can't. You have to turn your phone off." And I went, "Well, this is happening." And he said, "Right, like, I'll deal with that. You need to go through. You're late." So I rush through. That's when we find out we're going to be meeting Prince Charles, and you could hear people in the crowd go, "Oh," because they wanted to meet oh, the really? Queen. <laughs> I like wasn't bothered. I knew I'd just screwed up because my family weren't there. Yeah. And um, then <clears throat> you get to walk through the back of the ballroom, and that's when I spotted my family were there, and the police had practically let them park on the front lawn of Buckingham Palace. Oh wow! Okay. And it was massive. It was massive because. My family didn't understand what I was doing. In fact, they were a massive obstacle as I, you know, tried to go racing. Yeah. <clears throat> and finally, my dad could not hide the fact that he was proud That's of amazing. what I'd done. Yeah. Well, you know, you totally deserve it. And all the, th- all the things you've accomplished and done over that time has been amazing. And like you said, to be that that sort of, be that person <clears throat> that's gone from 
you know, not even knowing motorbikes and progressing to where you've got to now is, you know, you, you found, your family didn't have any background in it and progress where you are now is amazing. So what are your goals? And we just sort of spoke about that a little bit. <clears> with you, and you, what, yeah. is, what is also really, really cool, you think 24 years been doing it, you've still got goals. Yes. You've still got a point where you're like, I want to go and achieve that. And that's really, really important. Yeah, I think my role in the sports sort of changed. Getting the MBE made me think about giving things back to the sport. But also it kind of boosted me as well into this, you know, 10 years, which it is now since I got that. And uh, it kind of fueled my fire a bit. But yeah, so I went on and I got a podium at the Classic TT and becoming taking third place alongside my hero John McGuinness who has got 23 wins at the TT was massive even I have to look at the photographs still to sort of believe that it happened I'd like to go back and win that I'd like to go and challenge him again which we did last year unfortunately I had a mechanical fault while I was lying in second place and we didn't finish the race but I get to do that again the people that own the bike are actually from Switzerland they bring it all the way from Switzerland for me to race at the Classic TT so that's that's a massive goal now Classic bike racing is definitely a big thing in my career Um, then I've added in sidecars so that was big in my first year of racing sidecars I made history because we were the first all-female team to gain a podium position at the British Championship so that was great then I went on to do my first road race on it last year and my goal is to compete on it at the TT and become the first woman to race a sidecar and a solo at the same TT but I've had to sort of work to gain my entry into that that's that's been a bit tricky so I'm hoping I get an entry for that this year and uh, I've got a new race bike this year and I want to go back and do all the big internationals again and and see if we can better my best ever tt finish which is 12th so i'd like to get a top 10 that's amazing that is so <laughs> that is so cool and uh yeah i think obviously it's been it's been awesome sort of seeing your progression over the last few years and it's really really sort of inspiring to hear you've still got all these different goals that you want to try and achieve so yeah i keep saying you know i say to you all the time keep working towards them and keep aspiring because it's amazing but i really can't stress enough that crossfit and shy fit played a massive and you played a massive part in that and um and 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 still does you know and thankfully I, I you know I got addicted to CrossFit at the beginning and I know that it helps me massively in my sport it really does and you see a lot more motorcycle racers doing CrossFit now well yeah you, I remember you sort of telling loads of people about when we first started it and loads of people asking questions and see what you're doing well um thanks so much for on the podcast that was uh that was awesome really interesting to sort of talk and hear about some of your past my pleasure and uh, you. i'm sure we'll get you on again anyway to talk about more stuff because i've seen this list of different things there's so <laughs> much we can talk about but that's awesome thank you very much thanks jack how good was that awesome that was really good that was nice work What a fantastic podcast and thank you to Maria for jumping on and spending the time to talk all about her career and her past and also the future. I think the huge takeaway from that was number one, the amount of time and effort and sacrifice it takes in order to get to that highest level of that sport or of being successful. Um, as you can see, there were so many highs and lows during her career and the most important takeaway was that she stayed consistent and she doesn't give up. Even during the low points, she kept going and going and going and working through it. And even as you can see now, she's still got goals that she's trying to achieve and chase, which is really inspiring considering she's been on that bike and racing for so many years now. But I'm really, really excited to see her future. Obviously, you can give her a follow on her Instagram page, um, check her out her website. And guys, any more questions on the podcast, anything things you'd like to listen to, please drop me an email or drop me a message on Instagram and we'll, uh, we'll definitely plan it into future podcasts. So hopefully you can take something from it. Thanks team.